No. This is okay. the, the. Can you do a 20 minutes on elasticity? Do you remember? Do you remember Plastic Man comics? That's, that would, that would work. Everyone, hi. I think we should get started, so we'll have enough time for a good discussion. This is the clearly the ad hoc uh, <laughs> setup session. Um, we're going to move this table uh, more in the center and space ourselves out a little better uh, after the first presentation by Alan Flattis, which uses slides, but. We we're dealing with um, an, an improvised <laughs> setup slightly here. In any case, good morning and uh, welcome to this session on the present and future of architectural history in the context of architecture education. I'm Joan Ackman. The intention of the title of this panel, riffing on one of Nietzsche's untimely meditations, is to raise the question of the use or usefulness of history right now for students of architecture. De facto, history is always understood from the perspective of the present, whatever our claims for it in terms of objectivity or scientific knowledge. And different cultural eras tend to be marked by their inclination to be either backward-looking or forward-looking, relatively speaking, and by their varying recourse to the materials or facts of history. I think it's fair to claim that our own moment, um, and then we'll, we'll be able to debate this uh, in this session, uh, in this, the, the present moment in architecture, uh, at least the last two decades, have been characterized by a preoccupation with the future, particularly in relation to the major technological, environmental, and millennial milestones that have been crossed during this period. From this perspective, how does our pedagogy of architectural history stand today? How does it differ from previous eras? Uh, and uh, to immediately give the question a uh, more uh, motivated or ethical charge, uh, should it change? Uh, if so, how? What kind of history or histories do we need right now? In Nietzschean terms, once again, uh, to, uh, to uh, how, how does our history serve life? So in putting the question in such instrumental terms, we of course also run certain risks or dangers. What are these and how can we guard against them? In brief, these are some of the questions that uh, I've posed to the panelists this morning and I think we'll hear a variety of responses. I want to quickly uh, introduce our distinguished uh, participants here. Uh, most of, them, most of them need no introduction. They're, 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 they, they have eminent careers in, in our uh, field, but um, it gives me pleasure in any case to rehearse some of this. So um, Tom Fisher, uh, professor and dean of the College of Design at the University of Minnesota. Uh, in addition to his uh, long academic career, he's also been uh, much engaged in historic preservation. Uh, he was the editorial director of Progressive Architecture magazine and is the author of numerous books, including the most recent one, I believe it's the most recent one, but you can correct me if not, Ethics for Architects. Um, he holds degrees in architecture and intellectual history and served as president of this body of the ACSA from 2009 to 10. Um, Mary McLeod, um, back here, is a professor uh, at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, where she has taught history and theory and occasionally designed studio since the late 1970s. Her recent writing uh, focuses on contemporary architecture theory, the history of the modern movement, and feminism. She's the author, editor of the acclaimed monograph, Charlotte Perriand, An Art of Living. Um, and her dissertation, which was completed at Princeton in the 80s, was among the first to explore the question of Le Corbusier's politics, especially in the 1930s. And she holds degrees in architecture and architectural history. 
Alan Plattis uh, began teaching at Yale in 1986 after serving on the faculty uh, at Princeton, and he's published and lectured very widely in recent years, focusing especially on urban representation and history of cities, as well as on contemporary architecture and urbanism. He currently maintains a consulting practice focused on urban design, uh, and he founded Yale's Urban Design uh, workshop. He's been a past board member of the ACSA, the NAAB, the Journal of Architecture Education and Architecture Research Quarterly. Anthony Tony Schumann is a registered architect and associate professor of architecture at the College of uh, Architecture and Design at New Jersey Institute of Technology, where he has served both as undergraduate and graduate program director. He too is a past president of the ACSA. Um, he was a founding member of a series of advocacy and activist organizations uh, in architecture and planning professions, including Urban Deadline, the Architecture's Resistance, or TAR, Homefront, uh, and the Planners Network. He's a past chair of the New York chapter of Architects, Designers, and Planners for Social Responsibility and has been uh, also involved in preservation efforts, um, especially uh, in Newark, uh, where he was recognized last year with the Charles Cummings Award um, and uh, <coughs> a couple years before that, an award for institute and public service uh, at NJIT. In 2010, uh, he was named a distinguished professor by the ACSA. And last but not least, uh, Rebecca Williamson, uh, who is an assistant professor at the School of Architecture and Interior Design at the University of Cincinnati. Um, she is a registered architect with experience uh, practicing in Switzerland and New York. Uh, she received her PhD in architecture from Penn with a dissertation on political and architectural designs in 18th century Italy. Um, her essay on the Swiss firm of Dorish and Noli has just been published in the De Idebus series of monographs on contemporary architecture. Now, it gives me the greatest pleasure to be able to assemble uh, this particular panel because all of them uh, contributed to uh, the book that has just appeared, Architecture School, um, and uh, I, this is my uh, uh, opportunity to thank them publish publicly. Um, Mary uh, is the author of an extraordinary chapter in the chronological section of the book on the period 1968 to 80. Um, I have to tell you that, that Probably the other half of the chapter ended up on the cutting room floor since there was only <laughs> so much that could be fit into a 440-page book, um, but a, 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 a prodigious amount of research uh, went into uh, this uh, the, the writing on this um, fairly recent but now past period. Um, Alan, Tony, and Tom are the authors of <laughs> fine uh, lexicon entries on books. Um, community engagement and ethics, uh, respectively, um, and uh, I, I think you'll find them of, of, of great, great interest. And Rebecca uh, served as research editor and general co-conspirator with me on this magnum opus, and I'm deeply indebted to her for her extraordinary work in obtaining many of the images, as well as for her editorial input and imagination throughout the process. I've just had the pleasure of meeting several other people who I've actually never seen face to face before who also contributed to the book. And um, I ask that you would please identify yourselves. Uh, all the, all, all the, all, anyone who contributed to this book uh, who's in the audience, would you please stand up? So, uh, <laughs> so Madeline uh, Simon and uh, Ruth Connell. Marin and somebody else is here too. I, I thought uh, Kathy Anthony, of course. Anyway, uh, they, 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 these are four authors of, of lexicon entries in the book, uh, 35 authors in all, um, a, a, a wonderful collective effort. Um, well, now to the subject of this panel, uh, the format of which will be, I, I've asked each of the, 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 the four uh, main speakers to prepare a short statement um, uh, responding to some questions, uh, expanded questions that I circulated uh, in advance to them. 
Um, and uh, Rebecca Williamson will, will serve as a respondent. Um, the, we will intersperse these statements throughout uh, the, the session, um, but the, the intent is to uh, have a, a lively roundtable discussion uh, in which I hope the, the audience will also participate. So let me just, before I, I give uh, the uh, mic over to uh, Alan Plattis, who will start us off and allow us also to move over, um, <laughs> let me just um, read to you briefly some of the questions that I posed to these uh, speakers uh, in preparation for this. So um, the pedagogical role and importance of architectural history has continually changed over the course of the last century of professional architecture education indispensable in the Beaux-Arts system. History was notoriously banned from the incoming students' curriculum by Walter Gropius, who insisted on starting with design fundamentals, a modernist tabula rasa. Of course, this didn't stop him from making an exception in the late 1930s for the space-time lectures of Siegfried Gideon, uh, which were essential in establishing the, quote, growth of a new tradition. The repressed of history returned by the early 70s under the auspices of postmodernism, together with its twin, some might say its evil twin, theory. <laughs> More recently, post-critical uh, educators, we heard uh, something from George Baird uh, about this a moment ago uh, in the earlier session, uh, have demoted history and theory again, or history hyphen theory, um, viewing it as a uh, potentially a drag on innovation-directed learning. Meanwhile, the expansion of degree programs in disciplinary areas has made it an increasingly specialized pursuit. So what is the future of architectural history and the professional architecture program? Do you see it as being central or peripheral in the architect's education in coming years? Two, what kind of architectural history should be taught today? Is it important for it to become more relevant? Should it reflect global changes in the domain of architecture and in the world at large? Should it adjust to shifts in the nature and composition of student bodies uh, and new institutional and discursive frameworks? Do such modifications risk making architectural history into an operative, tendentious, and ideological discipline? What resources and settings are most effective for teaching and learning architectural history? The slide lecture, uh, the old-fashioned slide lecture in the required survey course, the weekly reading assignment and library reserve shelf in the elective seminar? Is it worth experimenting with other less traditional formats and technologies, integrating history into the design studio, making it the subject of dedicated study trips, using simulated <coughs> models to bring it to life? and so forth. What gener more generally, what is the ideal relationship of architectural history to design instruction and to other parts of the curriculum? And finally, three, within the historiography of architecture, the history of North American architecture education has been a neglected subject to date. What lessons might now be learned by revisiting the evolution over the last three centuries from apprenticeship to polytechnical school to Beaux-Arts pedagogy to modernist education. Did anything of value get lost along the way? What is still alive and what is dead in the succession of approaches to transmitting architectural knowledge? Is there any part of this inheritance you think is worth recuperating in relation to present day schools and pedagogical practices? So with that, Alan. <laughs> I'm going to trade seats with you. So if we each do 10 minutes on each of the questions. Seven. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> 30 minutes each. <laughs> So I get to go first because I brought pictures. It's the con wait, what did Joan refer to it as the conventional survey slide course or something <laughs> like that. Um, so you can imagine how we all felt when we he got Joan. Look at that. <laughs> we can. Uh, it, it, I, I somebody else could probably run this better than I can. You can imagine how we all felt when we got Joan's comprehensive survey, and you feel like uh, uh, saying yes, yes. Maybe, <laughs> let me think about it. Uh, yes, possibly. Um, 
And, and I'm going to, uh, as a uh, priv privilege of first speaker, I'm going to uh, say a couple of things and maybe save the rest of my colleagues the trouble. First of all, this room sucks. <laughs> and um, I don't know, there's a punishment that you suffer your entire life as an architect of having to sit in rooms that were made in inscrutable ways that don't house anything comfortably, and this is certainly one of them. Uh, not, yeah, Judy, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not staying over, so I can't comment on that. Uh, but the second and more important thing that I want to say is that is that we all owe uh, we and, and I mean the extended we owe Joan an enormous debt of gratitude for uh, uh, undertaking this uh, heroic Herculean task of uh, herding all the cats that participated and pulling uh, this together. It's the kind of project that m most of us would run screaming from. Uh, and I suspect halfway through it, Joan was somewhere around th there. Um, but, uh, but those of you who haven't had the privilege of undertaking such a project with Joan, it, owe it to yourselves to experience the incredible professionalism, uh, focus, um, intelligence, scholarship, you name it, that she and Rebecca brought to bear uh, on this project. Uh, I, I can't imagine anybody else who could have pulled it together. It's really an accomplishment. So uh, I, I'm sure everybody else will thank her individually, but I wanted to get that up front. I, I, I'm completely mystified by what this uh, uh, if there's anybody who has a better relationship with this machine than I do, you're welcome to it. So um, uh, here's, here, here are my thoughts. I, I think from what I've gathered from shared emails that probably in one way or another all of us will argue uh, in a positive way about the continued relevance of something like architectural history. Uh, to what we do, and even its centrality. As Judy DeMaio said to me as we sat down, uh, probably we're all preaching to the, this is the choir out here, and, and um, I suspect those who didn't want to hear something like this message probably are off in some other really cool uh, session <laughs> because they knew what really, Greg, Greg Lynn, so did, re exa exactly, what really, really predictably dull things we were going to say. But I think that we all also see history as an, an ever-expanding field, and uh, that uh, uh, just when you think uh, you've exhausted yourself, if not it, um, it opens up in unexpected and wonderful ways. It, therefore, it's a subject we return to, as far as I can tell, every 10 years. And the first slide, which actually is on the screen up there, um, it, it are a couple of uh, examples of that. One uh, is from a very uh, ancient now, George Baird probably referred to it this morning, but I missed his talk, 1965 ACSA Teachers Seminar, uh, where the question of, uh, of history and theory were considered. Um, that collection of essays, a little bit before my time, uh, included a wonderful title by Stan Anderson. Is Stan here today? No? Uh, uh, called, called inimitably, really, um, history that isn't trad, Dad, um, and it, it, it's much more profound than the title might suggest, although the title is wonderful and makes me wish that we all still talked like we did in the 1960s rather than the way we talk since post-structuralism. Um, but, uh, but it is, as I've suggested, an inexhaustible <laughs> subject. And the next title that I show is a book that came out of the Buell Center, ed edited by Gwen Wright. Uh, and that was a discussion that I was part of. I seem to remember at the time that I, in true post-structuralist fashion, argued for something along the lines of history without names. I was, at the time, suggesting that we, that we uh, uh, represent history to ourselves and our students by suppressing the personalities that had been the subject of so much traditional uh, history. So I'm not going to rehearse that one again today. But it was, uh, if I remember correctly, a, a, a provocative and interesting discussion at the time. All of that needs to be set against what history was when many of us came into the field. And I, the next slide, which I'll try to get up, is it going up? No? Oh, just, just, just it's, it's too simple. Um, 
If you all remember way back when, at the beginning of Nicholas Pevsner's outline of European architecture, uh, he suggested that one of the fundamental tasks for the historian was to help us distinguish between uh, what he called the bicycle shed and Lincoln Cathedral, uh, and uh, suggested that there was a fundamental difference between the poor old bicycle shed, which I take it he meant uh, as mere building, a vernacular building, if you will, although this is a rather nice bicycle shed, I think you have to agree, and probably not the one that Professor Sir Pevsner had in mind, uh, and the high architecture of Lincoln Cathedral. So there was that rather stuffy, exclusionary attitude. And then on top of that, as Joan mentioned, uh, we found ourselves, uh, in, in many ways, the heirs to a period uh, where, as Henry Ford famously put it, history was bunk. Or, uh, and not relevant to the creative uh, tasks of the architect, at least the history of certain kinds of things. Uh, just as we were coming out of that, uh, we come into a period now where the forces that we uh, designate as globalization seem to have, on the one hand, completely leveled culture uh, uh, across the planet, uh, reducing it to a process of branding, uh, or on the other hand, simply exacerbating the already tragic uh, gulf between local cultures, uh, one of the levels at which many of us feel history is truly produced, uh, and uh, the icons of globalization. Uh, but um, lest we despair, I think again, in the last decade or so, uh, history and its infinite fertility has opened up once again, and I have found work uh, by a wide range of uh, remarkable historians of my generation, inspirational in continuing to draw strength from, uh, uh, from this material and to see old material, not to throw out the old material, but to see it in that new expanded field. So to revisit uh, literally and figuratively the same old projects as opposed to trying to compile some new and exotic uh, bizarre canon uh, that we've never thought of before, but to revisit those old examples in new contexts is a powerful part of that. And I show you just a couple of examples which have been, I think, influential on my work and the work of my colleagues. Uh, uh, Wolfgang Schivelbusch's extraordinary uh, uh, one of uh, a trilogy of amazing exercises in cultural history of technology, this one, The Railway Journey, and then my former colleague Bill Cronin's book about Chicago, uh, where he opens up the whole field uh, now of environmental history, a field which he very much pioneered. And it's worth mentioning that Bill just became president uh, of the uh, American Historical Association uh, and uh, a, a recognition of the maturation of that field that's very important. I just want to pick one theme out of that sort of double-barreled um, uh, history now of technology and the environment, which I, uh, I think does provide at least part of that expanded field, and that is water, um, uh, which of course is everywhere, uh, and is one of those uh, themes that when you open it up with your students, not only recasts much of what you've been looking at all along, but suggests a whole set of new projects that are of some considerable urgency, both for historians and for practicing uh, architects and designers. In fact, about uh, three years ago, uh, the philosopher and uh, religious studies professor at Williams, Mark Taylor, published a rather provocative article in the New York Times where he suggested that we rewrite the curricula of our universities comprehensively, and the example that he gave as a new curriculum organizer was the theme of water. Uh, and at the time, uh, I remember reading it with some bemused skepticism, but uh, uh, as time has gone on, I think one can see uh, in this age, this post-Katrina age in which we live, uh, the extent to which uh, we really do uh, uh, tease out these themes wherever we turn and that they change the way in which we look at the great settlements that are the subject of so much of our work as designers and, and uh, historians, uh, but also our view of, of the uh, more or less uh, recent and distant past, uh, the centrality of technology and infrastructure such as it was, and the unavoidable urgency of water uh, for civilizations around the globe. For example, uh, the Chacoan civilization, uh, which probably disappeared around the 12th century precisely because of climate change. Uh, 
and a drought. And I think I'm correct in saying uh, that Tony and I made our first visits to Chaco Canyon together when we Absolutely. were on the editorial board of the Journal of Architectural Education and Diane Gerardo insisted that we rent gigantic American cars and drive them out in the desert to see Chaco. I've been back a couple of times since. Of course, it's one of the great sites. Or uh, uh, much closer to home, as it were, at least central to the mainstream tradition of what historians keep returning to, uh, the unavoidability of dealing with both the systemic and the monumental aspects of water uh, in uh, treating the monuments, the traditional monuments, and the traditional urbanism of Rome. The excellent work here I show you, Catherine Rinney uh, and others, and then, of course, the wonderful fountains that celebrate uh, architecturally the role that water plays in the city. And it provokes me at least, maybe Mary or a few other uh, uh, fanciers of the Swiss French architect Le Corbusier, to return to his scurrilous comments um, when he was asked to contribute in 1922 an urbanist project uh, to an exhibition in Paris and he uh, shot back rhetorically to the organizer, uh, well, what do you mean urbanism? And the organizer said, well, you know, street lights, uh, benches, kiosks, fountains, why don't you make me a fountain? And Le Corbusier replied, of course, I'll make you a fountain and behind it I'll put a city for three million people. <laughs> uh, as if to say fountains are not where it's at anymore, but I think fountains are becoming once again very much where it's at. And it reminds you, for example, that Charles Moore's dissertation at Princeton when he did a PhD was on water in architecture. Uh, so perhaps no accident that Charles kept spouting to the end of uh, <laughs> uh, his career. Um, and to understand a building then, uh, and to help our students understand buildings both historically and contemporary practice as parts unavoidably of much larger systems of settlement that are shaped around uh, often as uh, anything water uh, and the role that it's played at the scale of cities but the role that it might play in rethinking creatively the way we do business. This is a little map that my friend Pat Pinnell drew recently where he suggested that Connecticut take its medieval political structure of 169 fiercely independent towns and reconfigure it on the basis of watersheds. And that kind of thinking, of course, is going on, I think, in a number of venues. And I think architects and designers and planners and those of us who see things spatially should be leading that discussion. But to lead that discussion, we need to understand the whole scope of it. And finally, uh, uh, my feelings about this have been uh, uh, confirmed in a way by my involvement in an extraordinary recent project at a national level uh, that involves using shared water resources uh, in a region where water may at the end of the day be the single most desperate issue in the Middle East across incredibly hardened uh, uh, national borders uh, to stimulate new levels of cooperation. This is a project that recently uh, 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 a team of us from Yale uh, led a team of Palestinian, Israeli, and Jordanian architects for the first and probably, I'm sorry to say, the last time in history uh, to develop a peace park uh, along the Jordan River, a river that is holy to over half of humanity, uh, but is dead, completely dead because of the, uh, the extraction of water from it and the return of nothing other than raw sewage and dead bodies. Uh, and so to understand the role that it has played in that region historically and might play once again as a pretext uh, for bringing people together rather than, than uh, keeping them forever apart uh, has, as I said, uh, made this even more suggestive for me. So I don't want to run water into the ground. I'm sure there are other ways to expand the field. And uh, I'll turn it over. I'm not even sure to whom, Joan. Who gets well, to go this next? Is, this is a, this, these or do segues, we talk first? kind of organic uh, segues. Uh, we, we could talk uh, if, if, if anybody has particular comment on what Alan has just said, or we could just move to Mary. Uh, to, oh, do you, do you Yeah, I, and let's see if we can get rid of the apparatus yeah, here. That's what I'm would be uh, helpful. Thank you. Alan, thank you.
around as we talk. Yeah, Mary, do you no, want to no, sit this is fine for now. I wonder if we should um, stand up. Uh, yeah. People in the back have a hard time. I don't. If if we sit, can you all see us in the back, or would it be better? If, no, it's better if we stand. Okay, I was hoping to be more informal, but um, anyway, I too have. I, I think for all of us who didn't weren't here Thursday night, we just want to thank again um, not only ACSA for sponsoring this book, but of course Joan and Rebecca and I personally. The fact if. I was sort of wondering if my friendship with Joan would survive not only the cutting process, but my incredible procrastination. Um, but anyway, um, a deep debt of gratitude uh, to all involved, and especially Joan. I, I have some other thanks, though, and I'm going to be fast on this so we can get. Lots of you in this room helped me. Uh, I know Bob Geddes did. Um, I don't know who else is back there. Um, but it was really a collaborative process, not only of the authors, but of the many people that got bugged on the phone to answer questions that no one could remember about the 60s or the 70s, um, and who managed to send drawings. Um, and I uh, can only say there's lots more to be done, and I hope it will be done. I also have one other thank you. Um, one of the people I asked, uh, besides Dean Geddes, who was my dean, uh, was Tony Vidler, who won the uh, award last night, the Centennial Award. And I think I'm very grateful to have had a mentor, a teacher, a dissertation advisor. And I was thrilled that a historian got the topaz. Some recognition, I think. Not the topaz, sorry. George is another person who helped a lot. The Centennial Award, a recognition that history had a role. Um, I want to start off by saying first that, as you might expect, I think I'm the only person who has to teach required history courses on the panel. Is that true? <laughs> of course I'm going to say history is important. Um, but I also want to argue rather vehemently against an instrumental idea of history, uh, that it should be in the service of a particular style or movement, or that it should be in the service only of studio. That doesn't mean I'm against history being relevant um, or even using historical examples, and I'll get back to that. But I think it's absolutely essential that history be looked at as, as something of validity in itself, a place to explore ideas in depth, uh, and to understand a context in which buildings and ideas about architecture uh, were produced. Uh, so if there is an instrumentality for me, it's to encourage students to think uh, when I teach. And uh, when Ken Frampton and I uh, designed uh, a sort of required history survey, uh, we structured it around issues or themes chronologically, but ways in which we hope students would engage with the kinds of questions, forces, circumstances uh, that shaped ideas in the period. Uh, rather than go, I'm rather eclectic, all those things Joan said, I, like Alan, I would say yes, no, maybe. Uh, and I certainly try to use uh, technology, but I'm pretty bad at it. Um, but anyway, let's go on. There are two themes I want to address in particular. Uh, and one is uh, that word that has become so chic, so ubiquitous, that I sometimes wonder if it means anything. Uh, globalization, which is part of the expansion of the field. ACSA was rather a pioneer in requiring uh, courses outside the European and American canon. Uh, and there's been huge debates at Columbia uh, about how to handle, it, handle that. And I want to suggest two strategies and also to suggest some qualifications I have about some approaches that have been proposed, not to say that they aren't worth considering, uh, but perhaps they're worthy of some debate. Uh, the first thing I want to warn against, if you will, uh, is what an approach that has become rather fashionable lately to take a date 
like 1500 and see what's happening in China and what's happening uh, in Europe uh, and somehow put the two together. And for me as a historian who's really concerned about uh, connections as well as differences, uh, it's very hard to, one, get into either with sufficient depth to understand them in their own terms, uh, but also uh, it absolutely uh, makes it very difficult to look at issues of causality, transformation, et cetera, unless there are real connections and links, which of course grow uh, in the course of history. Um, and Um, and I, the other thing that I sort of warn against is what I call instant experts or the tourism of otherness. Um, we're told constantly, oh, include a little of this, include a little of that, where you know, a two-week trip to Shandigar or Dhaka makes us instant experts on you know, South Asia. And I really would argue very strenuously that if we have a commitment to a more global approach, which I certainly do, that we hire um, experts, that we also encourage more intensive study of other cultures and traditions. So we're not just seeing this once again from our own eyes, a kind of intellectual imperialism, uh, if you will. What are the strategies I, I sort of see as options? One is intense courses uh, in various areas but also courses that explore connections between cultures. Um, there's been a lot of marvelous work looking lately at translation uh, between like German-Turkish exchanges, and I think those are very rich ways of, of looking uh, not just at differences, but at the ways ideas uh, are exchanged, alter, transform uh, in contact with other cultures. The other strategy, which is probably all I can do given my expertise, is to just be very aware, for instance, when I'm teaching European uh, and American architectural history, and somehow Ken Frampton got me stuck with the um, 18th and 19th century, which is not my area of expertise, but after a number of years, I've sort of gained a little knowledge. Um, to look at the intersections when they do occur. Um, and for instance, when I'm teaching English picturesque, uh, it's impossible not to recognize that someone like William Temple or Lord Kames absolutely admire Chinese gardens. Uh, to look at the fact that Mario Ripa, a Jesuit priest, uh, etchings of Jay Hull, had a tremendous impact in early 18th century Britain. So I want to alert students to these influences, make them conscious, not just of sort of knee-jerk orientalism, but also the sort of positive regard, if sometimes mythic regard, uh, of other cultures and how they influence developments. And I could use other examples, Rococo with chinoiserie, locking somebody up so he could learn how to imitate Chinese porcelain. Uh, we could go on and on. But there, I, I think once you're open, as, as Alan said, to expanding the field, you realize that even mainstream kind of survey courses can touch outside the boundaries of uh, pure kind of European monuments. Um, the other subject, of course, I, very close to my heart that I can't resist is gender and uh, women. Uh, and I think, too, I would encourage a two-prong approach. Specific seminars and courses, uh, and this for me, in fact, there are several in the room that were in my very first course on gender, and short, they sure gave me a tough time. Um, there were a bunch of men, believe it or not, and did I get grilled? <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, not because they weren't sympathetic, but actually making me work harder at getting at the ideas. Uh, but I think these courses office often became a place to explore extension of the boundaries, not just including women, but how is architectural rhetoric gendered? Uh, to what extent is the definition of the field 
exclusionary in terms of areas where women were important, like domestic reform, uh, even garden design. Uh, so again, I, I think there's room for very specific courses, but also surveys. If you teach Frank Lloyd Wright in the Prairie School House, remember that he published in House Beautiful, uh, that there were domestic reformers like Christine Frederick who were rethinking the home, uh, that he was interested in someone named Ellen Kay, uh, that he uh, in fact, has his name on a translation that he probably didn't do, uh, a very important a, a Swedish domestic feminist. So again, I think it's a kind of alertness of how to expand it. Two or three quick points that I won't talk about about architectural education and then turn it over. Um, I, the first thing that came to mind when I was working on this essay that took forever uh, was how little has been done. And so number one, I'd encourage all of you who have any power in schools to do histories uh, of your schools, to encourage exploration because this history is disappearing. Uh, people do not keep documents. And I don't want history just to be of those schools who are self-conscious. I was so conscious in writing the essay how little I knew about Kansas, um, Iowa State, uh, various schools that maybe there are even books, but I don't know about them. And, and so I think that's essential. Uh, two other points. Uh, one. Uh, the good and the bad. Of course, you know, you learn the lessons of history, you can't ever follow them directly. But there was a quality of deja vu that seems so relevant to me. Um, I, I was working with the critiques of systems theory, uh, behavioral design, scientific approaches that were so dominant in the 60s. And by the mid-70s, even in Berkeley, were under vicious attack. Berkeley was one of the heyday places where this was really big. And I couldn't help but feel like the rhetoric was so similar to what I was hearing at Columbia by the late 90s, self-regulating, system, scientific, authorless, um, a kind of rationalism that was without personal subjectivity exactly what was being critiqued earlier in the 70s. So never is it the same, but a kind of alert to what extent um, does history help us sort of become more self-critical and reflect on what we're doing. On the positive <coughs> side, what I totally dismissed when I was a student um, on the East Coast in the 70s, I gained new respect for. I used to think Berkeley was talk architecture. Uh, we thought all they did was, you know, go in the country and build shacks and talk about, you know, dirt. Um, and I, <laughs> and um, I think what happened doing this article was I realized that important things leading to ecology, uh, concerns with the environment were happening. They weren't the composition I was learning, the layering, the grids, and everything else, but something else equally legitimate uh, was happening. And I, for instance, Oregon with uh, John Reynolds or Charlie Brown, these are teachers who sustained environmental interests when everybody else had sort of forgotten them in the heyday of POMO. So um, the last thing I wanted to raise was, is our professionalization, I, I guess what I was, I don't know how to put this, what kept striking me in the struggle between institutional history and a kind of history of names that Alan referred to was how much names kept surfacing. Uh, whether it was Colin Rowe, whether it was John Haydock, uh, whether in terms of historians, people like Egbert for Venturi or um, Scully. And I kept wondering, uh, not for the latter two who had academic uh, credentials, but when it, whether many of the great teachers of the period I was talking about, like Colin Rowe, Haydock, uh, could in fact get tenure in the current process. Is the whole system of professionalization that counts magazine articles, buildings, working against the kind of dedicated teacher who's really thinking about pedagogy and teaching? And it's a question I can't answer. Other things have been gained by institutions, greater diversity, uh, perhaps fairer procedures. But I also wonder if something uh, may have been lost as well. Thanks. Okay.
Mary, you've put so many uh, big uh, issues out there. Uh, I'm not sure where where uh, to, to kind of chime in here. I, I suspect, though, with your last point, that Rebecca may have some response on the in, in institutional issue. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Let's yeah. let's do that. So why don't we just proceed? Um, Tom, you you, you look. You look like matter? you look, of course, I, 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 yeah. Tom always looks eager, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Well, I'm not an historian. I, I uh, teach ethics, write about ethics. Uh, although one thing, I, uh, the impact Colin Rowe had on me was to get me interested in intellectual history. So all my graduate work was in the history of ideas. And one of the things I learned there is that in addition to architectural history, there's a way to talk about history through architecture. In other words, architectural history is not just an end in itself, but it's a means to understanding culture. And uh, I would urge us to recognize that there's a lot of interest in other disciplines in engaging with us on that task. Um, and, um, but one of the things to me that uh, drives, me, uh, drives my interest in ethics and this kind of history, a kind of um, uh, history through architecture is that it can offer, often ask uncomfortable questions about uh, unchallenged assumptions about power and privilege and about our often unexamined responsibilities to others who have neither. Uh, I think this is particularly an issue in our field, which is, uh, to reference again Nietzsche, as Joan did, uh, he called architecture the will to power by means of form. And our field, I think, uh, because of its difficulty and expense, often finds itself complicit in accommodating and reinforcing the power and privilege of those who have the money to commission it. And so uh, because of the questions it asks, I think a kind of ethically grounded history uh, can play an incredibly important role um, in uh, asking questions uh, that architects, frankly, often don't want asked. For example, who isn't at the table? What isn't being addressed? And who is or isn't benefiting from what we're doing? Um, and, uh, and I think that in that sense, history and ethics uh, can seem like a threat to architecture. Um, and, I, and I think in part, I believe this is partly why we consistently deal with this attempt to marginalize it. Um, for example, the rise of architectural education in the second half of the 19th century also coincided with Oscar Wilde's attempt to segregate aesthetics and ethics. Uh, he was trying to protect aesthetics from the moralism of his day. But I think one of the downsides of that separation, and we saw it in the formalism of Beaux-Arts architecture, which while history was uh, ir uh, indispensable for the Beaux-Arts, um, uh, it's still focused on the creation of classical facades and idealized interiors and exteriors that papered over the industrial pollution, the environmental destruction, and the social inequality that enriched the very clients who were commissioning that work. Um, and in that sense, I think architectural history, by being often too narrowly focused on retelling the tales that make architects feel good about what we're doing, um, tends to stick too close to the official story. And one of the things I learned from intellectual history is that it's actually, the, it's sometimes intellectuals who are uh, offering a more critical assessment of architecture than architectural historians are doing. Um, and I think architects played a very paradoxical role in this. On one hand, uh, as I said, the profession was complicit in enabling those in power to feel good about themselves, with the discourse in schools of architecture largely focused on the skill with which students would learn this classical disguise. Uh, on the other hand, the profession itself found itself increasingly exploited by those in power, which led in 1909 to the AIA's first code of ethics. And the prohibitions in that first code against the exploitative practices of clients wanting architects, for example, to give away our design ideas in unpaid competitions or to compete for work based on who had the lowest fees shows just how much the unfair treatment uh, that had enriched those who had commissioned buildings had become applied to architects ourselves. Um, and so to me, one of the things that um, history can not only ask questions that make us uncomfortable, but also ask questions that make our clients uncomfortable. And that is a, something that admittedly most architects don't want to do, but I believe it is an absolutely essential role for critics, for historians uh, to, to do and um, to challenge the power uh, within which we have to work. 
Uh, the rise of modern architecture in the schools in the 20s and 30s may seem like a ripping away of the Beaux-Arts facade, the recognition of the needs of the working class, and certainly modern architects' admiration of industrial architecture with the emphasis on transparency, attention to new kinds of programs like worker housing, all reinforce that appearance. But I would argue that modern architecture actually represents a new kind of ethical and historical sleight of hand, based on what the philosopher William Barrett has called the illusion of technique. While modern architecture seem more sympathetic to the plight of the working class through the use of industrial materials and methods, the profession and the schools did little to challenge the social, economic, or political power of clients. In addition, the international style ignored differences of culture or climate, turning the idea of universal rights into a form of repression. In fact, one thing that we might talk about is why do we uh, separate um, the history of architecture from uh, natural history, from the history of nature? And is this, this a time, a moment in time, where in fact we have to broaden uh, the discourse about architecture to recognize that it is inseparable from natural history? And then finally, ethics emerged in the late 1960s as an explicit area of study in architectural education, becoming part of the accreditation process in the 1970s. And since then, we've seen this flourishing of ethical questioning in the schools, be it challenges to the dominance of men and male ways of thinking on the part of feminist ethics, or challenges to the dominance of humans over other species, on the part of environmental ethics, challenges to the dominance of capitalism and its exploitation of workers on the part of Marxist ethics, or challenges to the dominance of reason and abstract rationality on the part of phenomenology. Um, and I think that is in this ethical uh, uh, questioning that started to occur in the schools that led to some of the tensions that existed in the latter part of the 20th century between the schools and the profession. That it, we were increasingly asking questions <clears throat> that again made architects not so much uncomfortable themselves, but I believe uh, uncomfortable in their relationships to clients. This ethical churn in architectural education, I think, has greatly enhanced and enriched the intellectual life of our schools, although I think it has had relatively little impact on the profession still dependent on individuals, organizations, and communities with enough wealth and power to commission us, and um, which I think has begun to wash back over the schools of late as architectural education has seen the resurgence in aestheticism, formalism, and the illusion of technique as a result of the digital revolution, in which computer-generated form-making and digital fabrication methods have, I believe, too often become ends in themselves, with the needs of the global population, future generations, and other species on the planet largely overlooked. And that, in some ways, the digital turn, as was mentioned yesterday, and uh, the ethical turn may seem antithetical. But in a way, I think history gets the last word in this, because um, I do believe that uh, uh, history, uh, as it should be done, uh, is, is constantly in the process of revealing the unexamined assumptions of everything we do, including um, um, things such as the digital, activities such as the digital turn, which I would argue is a profoundly conservative activity, one of the most conservative movements in architecture we've had in several generations, simply by the fact of all of the things it, leads, it leaves undiscussed. Uh, so I think for all of us, it's a matter of paying attention uh, in, our, in our teaching and in our work to the issues that are not addressed in a design, uh, paying attention to what questions don't get asked in reviews, uh, and to what goes unsaid in the stories we tell about ourselves as a profession and a discipline. And I think that is where we will find the will to power in our field, and I think it's also where we will rediscover the real power of history and ethics. So thank you. Thank you. So in, in addition to finding it quite a pleasure to work with Joan as editor, it's really quite a privilege to share this, this panel. Um, one, of the things, one of the things that occurred to me in, in, uh, in working with Joan during this process, I, I wish she had worked with Robert Caro. Um, some of you have read The Power Broker. It's a wonderful book, but it could be cut by 150 pages. <laughs> and, and, and the way it would be cut is because what Caro tried to do is what Joan tried wisely not to do, which was to put all the separate narratives into one master narrative, and it keeps recycling back. And I think the decision in this book to have a series of historical uh, periodized essays that cover the, the, the basic history and then a set of lexicon entries that are able to focus in on separate topics without burdening each history with all of those histories, 
I think was really a, a, brilliant, a brilliant decision. Um, so I'm going to address, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll be the simplistic one here. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do history, uh, who, did, who teaches history, and what history. Um, the only card-carrying historian on the panelist here, of course, is Mary. And the, and, and, and the, and the, rest, of, the rest of us are, of the four of us anyway, and the, the rest of us are, are architects with, with various training and experience background who, uh, who incorporate history because it's, it's, it's the way we understand both architecture and the world. Um, but I, and, and when I think of historians, I mean the, the classical model, and I have colleagues who work a lot this way, is archival research, it's a lonely pursuit, it's hours of, hours of work in libraries and archives, uh, and of course not to mention the writing. But Mary also mentioned the collaborative aspect of history, uh, and you know, for me, I, I guess, because I'm not a historian, it's maybe mainly the only way I, I know how to do it. Sure, I do, like anyone else, research. Uh, that takes me to libraries or also to places to, to dig that out. The, the essay that I contributed to this book on community engagement, though, is a very good case in point. I started that by sending out a survey to all of the ACSA member schools to say, please give this to the person who's involved with community <laughs> engagement, however you define that. And I sent them a little questionnaire. And I got back out of 140 schools maybe 15 responses. But, not, but, that's, but there were substantive responses, obviously. The people who responded were deeply engaged. So I heard from Roberta Feldman at Chicago. I heard from Sally Harrison at Temple. But the one that really got to me in particular was from a fellow named Robert Swenson, Bob Swenson, at the University of Southern Illinois Carbondale, which I, I gather is now a candidate school for an accredited program, but they've been active ACSA members for years. This, of course, is where Bucky Fuller was in the 60s. And Swenson said a very interesting thing. He said that uh, he was part of a group of students uh, that went out into eastern Kentucky uh, under the influence of a, a teacher, and there was, this was a community development program there, not in architecture, uh, under the influence of a teacher who had trained with Saul Alinsky. So he and a bunch of students went out into eastern Kentucky and they did organizing there. The next year Swenson went to Yale and, the, and that was the year that, that Charlie Moore arrived at Yale and he, Charles Moore wanted to introduce a, a design build program and he wanted to do something relevant and Swenson said, well, let's go to Kentucky. Uh, and that's, wh that's why the Yale program started in Kentucky. And of course, within a year, it was brought back to work in New Haven. But one of the themes that I develop in my essay w w is this initial identification of community organizing with design build and its eventual bifurcation into architects more concerned with making things and architects more concerned with, with working and, and uh, engaging in a different way with the community. But it was, it was a, a revelation to me that at the beginning, they started out together uh, with you know, maybe one degree of separation. So that was, that was one example of, of a collaborative approach that produced useful information. Another was simply working with Rebecca in particular on this, who, who, who shot to me uh, doing, she was doing early archive um, into AC, it was at ACSA meetings, and there, there was, there was a, a, a reference to an article by Charles Colbert, who was the dean at Columbia, just, he left just before I started there, um, which sort of indicated the lack of engagement and understanding of universities going up into the mid-60s, literally about the same time that Swenson was in eastern Kentucky, um, Colbert was assuming that, you know, well, the architecture schools can unravel the confusion of the cities, you know, without, without benefit of, of, uh, of, of partners in that discussion. Um, who teaches history? Well, I, I, I know and I, I suspect this is true at school. There, there are some historians who believe that only card-carrying historians should teach history and the rest, the rest of us amateurs should stay out of it. I don't think probably this room is filled with those people, but there are some. Uh, and conversely, there are architects who think that uh, historians should stay out of the design studio unless they happen to be licensed architect as well. And of course, any of these extreme positions leaves out lots of serendipitous possibilities that that cross-fertilization uh, might produce. One of the ways that, that uh, this happens is, well, if there is a history course that's separate from studio, but the studio is focused on a given building type or a given period, you work with the person teaching history and say, well, can't we give some special attention to this topic this semester? It's a real simple way and it can, and can be extremely helpful. Probably the most common way that we address our history in studio is through uh, case study precedents. And although this, this is a, an approach that can be abused, it's also one of, in my experience, one of, one of the richest ways uh, to, to introduce history, to, to uh, inculcate a, a, a love of, of uh, inculcate some level of literacy in terms of the common past, but also if you understand the historical precedents in their own context, it becomes a way of understanding uh, our own context today. So for example, I'm teaching third year undergraduate studio. This semester we're doing a branch library, and obviously one of the pieces is you do precedent studies of libraries. But you know, 
first of all, because some of my, all, of my all of my colleagues are younger than I am, the, the, the precedents that excite them are probably different than the ones that some of us might readily recall historically. Uh, but that's, that's helpful to me. But then you go back and say, well, how many books were in the Laurentian Library? Right, you know, and, and you, begin, you begin to think about the history of reading, the history of the printed word, and, and these days, of course, the word that's not on paper. Uh, and it introduces a whole series of discussions that, that you can have in studio with undergraduate students without necessarily deep uh, prior intellectual background. So, I mean, I, th I find this as a, as a te teaching methodology still uh, extremely, extremely valuable and extremely viable. Um, the final th th thing that I would like to address is, well, what history? And, and of course, starting with, with Joan and obviously the, the way the book is organized, there's a notion that there are, there are many histories. And even though at the end of the day, architecture may privilege the built artifact or the legacy of form, as Bob Getty said yesterday, um, there are lots of, lots of histories within that, um, that over, overarching narrative. Um, in my school, the, you know, generally the history courses are taught by historians, but there are a lot of electives or selectives um, that are taught by people like myself that occasionally are able to count as a history selective, not because it's a, it's a methodical uh, approach to history from, ex, uh, from one day to another, but because the, the nature of the course content itself introduces history in a useful way. I mean, I have, I have said, um, not entirely facetiously or rhetorically, that I could teach the history of 20th century architecture by looking at social housing in Berlin. Um, and if you think about that, it's close. I mean, it's obviously you wouldn't do that, but, but if, you, if you really take a close look at it and see where it started and what, what, what arrived at the end of the uh, century, I think you can do that. I teach a course now called Architecture, this has to do with, well, what histories? I teach a course called Architecture and Social Change, obviously the topic that has uh, effectively um, captivated my interest during my entire career. Uh, and at the, you know, a lot of this is based on students interviewing each one an architect who's practicing today who in a variety of ways approaches this. That's not history, that's contemporary practice. Um, but the history that we look at is a mixture of social theory. So for example, the students have read Saul Alinsky, Paolo Freire, Francis Fox Piven uh, as giving sort of what is a theory of social change because they ask the architects, what is your theory of social change if you're engaged in this? And I think you'll find um, not all of us have always theorized that. The same way that Sarah Whiting said to George Baird, maybe this is the chance to give you a pause to, ref to reflect. Um, that's what we do for the architects. Um, but in addition to doing that kind of history, then what else do we look at? Well, obviously we're going to look at the constructivists and the Bauhaus and Siam and Team 10. So there are all kinds of histories that get brought forward both inside uh, our discourse and from outside of it. Uh, and at the end of the day, then the question is, well, what, what ties all of these discussions together? Uh, and I'll, I'll refer again to the talk that Bob Geddes gave yesterday. Uh, and he said, well, architecture is about fit. And that fit is to purpose, to place, uh, and also to social and political conditions. And he said the social imagination is as important as the physical imagination. And my guess is that most of us in this room subscribe one way or another to that. And I think we all probably have different ways of getting at that. But I think uh, if, if I step back now and think I'm going to speak now about undergraduate architecture education, because we, we, we had some very interesting talks by Kermit Baker and, um, in terms of what unemployment is in the field and this, that, and the other. I think if, if I didn't feel that, that a major in architecture wasn't a good general education, I think I'd have to get out of that business. Be because, because, number one, I don't think it's axiomatic that every one of our graduates should, must, or will want to practice architecture. And the question is, what, what else do they go into the world with? Well, they certainly go out with a great set of digital skills, which is, which is helpful. But do they have the, the, undergrad, the, the, uh, the underpinning intellectual understanding of what they do? It's a difficult task, because we have our hands full, given all that architecture encompasses, um, you know, just, just to get the line weight right. I was talking to someone who said, that in fifth year, I'm, we're still working on line weight. Right? And, the, and the question is, how, how, how with, with that burden do we, do we also at the same time introduce the, the rich context that, that could be there? Um, and I think to me that's, that's the challenge of education and um, I think history plays an essential role in that. Thank you. I, I uh, prepared a, a few words based on what the panelists said they were going to say, and I'd prefer to read them before we um, enter into general conversation. 
miss it, sorry. The panelists share in different ways in a concern, in a concern for architecture's connection with what Tom calls uncomfortable questions. The social, environmental, and ethical ramifications of what we do and the acknowledgement of the multiple histories that comprise and intertwine with the history of architectural education in North America. Joan has asked us to consider history both as a component of the curriculum and as a means to reflect upon what we do. The former question of the advantages and disadvantages of, the architectural, his of architectural history in the curriculum is one that architecture educators have been asking for a long time, as we've seen in some of the, particularly Alan's presentation. Um, except for the period of Gropius's curricular purge, the study of pre-existing buildings and documents has never been fully excluded from architecture education, just as a medical or law school would not long dare to eradicate the study of prior cases. The perennial questions relate to which works we examine, by what means, and what we do with what we learn from them. Joan's last question of the advantage of the history of architectural education as a lens to examine the present or how history serves life is the area in which the book's most significant contribution lies. In the process of working with authors, documents, and institutions, it became clear to us that some of the most basic questions one might ask in describing the history of an entity resisted simple answers. What was the first collegiate school of architecture in North America? What do we mean by collegiate? Do we consider the date of establishment of the program of enrollment of students or of granting of a degree? Do we consider accredited programs only? How do we account for the military academies, mechanical institutes, drawing schools and clubs, some of which were absorbed into collegiate institutes, some of which would later be accredited? While we chose to accept the commonly held notion that MIT was the first collegiate program in architecture that is extant as an architecture program, accredited program, we were struck by the variety we found. If we understand architecture not as a monolithic field, but rather an array of practices, Joan's question about history in the curriculum ha has greater implications than identifying which architectures and which practitioners reside inside or outside the official history. The existence of a category of outsider depends on the determination of a mainstream body of institutions. Degree granting, accreditation, and licensure in architecture came into being as responses to perceived needs to ensure quality with control of access to cre credentials as the means of enforcement. The institutions that oversee these processes of legitimization are themselves construction. The Committee of Educa on Education was one of the AIA's first initiatives, out of which arose ACSA, which together with AIA and NCARB later produced NAAB. NCARB has a separate history arising out of independent state boards and was initially viewed with suspicion by the AIA as a potential bastion of special interests unsympathetic to the nobler causes of architecture and architectural education. That's pretty much a verbatim quote. <laughs> the manufacturing of architectural credentials, while often proposed as a means to elevate the field, has at times been a marginalizing force. Take, for example, the history of African American involvement in architecture and architectural education. The new world was built by both black hands and white, yet the emergence of a professional identity of the architect tended to stratify the field. Design build, one of the mainstays of contemporary architecture education, first em emerged in the historically black colleges and universities that followed the pedagogic theories of Booker T. Washington, despite controversy at the time over th about those theories. In the early years of ACSA, one of the primary reference points in the project of furthering uh, defining ar architectural education was Abraham Flexer's 1910 study of medical schools. While Flexner is credited with launching a wave of modernization of medical education, his report resulted in the closure of a large portion of the institutions that had educated African-American doctors. And that's actually seen as having broad implications even to our day in terms of access to medical care in that community. The current time seems to be one of contradictions. Faced with the lure of new technologies and the pressures of increasingly brutal economies, the students with whom I come into contact, most of whom have spent their academic years alternating periods of professional practice with time on campus, seem to be probing the definition of what it means to be an architect more concertedly than their predecessors. 
The troubles of recent years have hit our field harder than others, and they are acutely aware that the un unemployment rate in architecture is one of the highest among university graduates. They don't see the degree as a ticket. They love architecture, are hungry to learn its history, yet understand that the world in which they will be working will be anything but static. The challenge for architecture's institutions is to recognize that, despite ongoing efforts in some quarters to elevate architecture through its credentials, the most important result of an education is not the label, but the capacity to act. So those are my thoughts, and so I guess I, I, my role as respondent is also to launch questions. I mean, my question that I would put back to uh, the speakers is how does architecture history serve the life of architecture, the life of architecture education, and life in general? Does anybody, any, anybody want to take a stab at that huge question? Um, as usual, we're up against uh, time here, and the hope for a, a round table, I, I think, has been uh, probably well, the, the I'll, 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 say, I'll say one quick word, because I, I am, am struck that, that we have, for a very long time, allowed a little bit of a polarizing debate to develop in terms of the role that history and, let's say, history and theory play in the schools and in the culture of architecture. And, and Mary alluded to that. And ever since, certainly ever since uh, the translation of Manfredo Tafuri's work, there has been a concern that historians and critics and theorists are, are the ones who are ideally positioned, as Tom would put it, to be the conscience of the profession, that they can step back, they can demystify, they can uh, uh, reveal the contradictions, whatever lingo you want to use to describe how that role plays out. Um, and I think that, that there, there is an inherent tension uh, in that between what historians have also done in the context of architectural education and the profession, which is to ground our students. And that speaks to something that Tony alluded to, didn't say Quite literally, I'll just say it more bluntly, which is that we, we do expect at some level our students to be educated people, and I don't think there has ever been an appropriate definition of what it means to be a broadly educated person that doesn't include an awareness, uh, a, a serious awareness and immersion in history. So that's this other role that historians play vis-a-vis -vis our students and also the profession to some degree is to ground it, is to, is to give it a place to be within the world. And I don't think that's a fundamental contradiction to the critical role that it plays. But I think sometimes we let it be that way. Maybe, yes, maybe since we only have about 10 minutes left here, we, we should open it up to the audience. And Beverly. Uh, uh, yes, I grab the microphone because I'm aware we have maybe about two minutes left and, <laughs> and I wanted to introduce the public voice here. You know, not the educators and not uh, the student voice. The wonderful histories that are written by people in this room and others are read by the general public. And that general public may include clients, we know it includes high school students. We know that high school students, for example, are looking to books as well as film and other media uh, to decide what they want to do with their life and who they want to uh, imitate, so to speak, who are the heroes. Uh, the same thing with young adults, as I said, possibly clients, you know, in terms. So. Uh, Having people in history books, role models in history books, is incredibly important to our entire society. And I might say it's also incredibly important to women, particularly when women have been excluded primarily from the history books. And also when they have been mentioned, such as we found out when we did our research for the Guggenheim Museum, for their 50th anniversary celebration on the program that we did for them, often the women are incorrectly described in the history books. Uh, the case in point uh, being, uh, uh, I'm having a little block now, uh, of Frank Lloyd Wright, 
uh, uh, the second woman after Mary Mahoney, and she's described in all the history books as being a bookkeeper. Well, we found a letter written in Frank Lloyd Wright's hand that recommends her as an architect, a well-educated, multi-year educated architect, which brings up the question again, the accuracy when women do get in the history books, you know, is terribly important. Anyway, just remember that even though you're writing your books for the academy, it's being read by others. Thank you. I, I, again, since we have such a short time left, I'm wondering whether, Bob Geddes, you would be uh, interested to, to comment. So much of what was said here today reminded me a lot of, your, of the Princeton Report days when the, the concept of the, an expanded field uh, was really at issue. And um, the, 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 the problem of the discipline and also of general education in relation to architecture were absolutely crucial. So, of course, um, history repeats itself, so we're, we're, we're going to, to see how it does so or hear uh, maybe from a voice from uh, a previous generation uh, tell us how, <laughs> how, how current Joan, we are. Or how Joan, everything I said you ever said was lovely except that notion well, of a previous, we, we, yeah, we, we, I'm we a bit. The the, the voice the of the English, wisdom. Uh, yeah, okay. The English have it wonderful. It's a bit previous. Well, um, I, I'm. Uh, delighted to be asked. Um, I have to say a few positive things about the Gropius uh, Harvard era. Um, I, I think you, many of you use it as a, as a whipping girl. Um, <laughs> and uh, perhaps fairly. But in fact, Grope had in mind that you um, uh, do history after you do the basic design and you really learn. Uh, I had, uh, for example, the experience when I was at the GSD, uh, Joe Passano and I would come over and take courses at uh, MIT. He uh, borrowed Janet's bicycle and went back and forth and became an engineer. I, came, I went back and forth uh, having studied with Kepish at MIT. Uh, curious because Kepish, if, of all the teachers I ever met, was the closest to the Gropius ideal of actually learning from seeing and feeling and uh, the uh, visual uh, language. Uh, so I think in a, f in a certain sense uh, it isn't fair to him, um, but it's also not fair to him that he allowed me, he gave me a fellowship to go to, to Europe to, uh, to see things, uh, never having studied the history of it. And that was probably his greatest error with respect to me. I discovered Pevsner's book. You realize when, when, when I studied architecture at Harvard, there were almost no books of history. Uh, the, 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 the books we looked at was Gideon and, yeah, okay. Um, it, it was Gideon, there was uh, Alfred Roth's book, The New Architecture. Um, there were Corb's books, but really uh, the, the books shelf would have been from there to there. Um, and I think we have come a, a great long way in, in the integration of history. I, I think the history is not just architectural history. In fact, there probably is no such a thing as architectural history separate from all sorts of other dimensions of history. But today, it, it, I, I am extraordinarily pleased to see the, the uh, production, uh, the use, uh, the interest in, uh, in, uh, in the many dimensions of architecture, including, most particularly, uh, the social. Uh, it seems to, I mean, there is, for example, Hal Foster's new book, Grow the Art and Architecture Complex. Uh, there are books which deal with architecture and technology. There, there are so many uh, uh, combinations, but it seems to me that the really essential is to see architecture uh, in, uh, in a social context but that, we, that we recognize that architecture and society are inseparable. And that is what uh, ties us into so many levels of history. A couple of other minor points, but they, they, they resonate with me. I remember when at, at, at Princeton when we had uh, the thought that we might have another kind of PhD program, and it might be called history and theory. Uh, 
and I ran into Lawrence Stone, the eminent social historian, in the hall, and I said, well, they're talking about the possibility of a program in history and theory. And he said, take your choice. <laughs> and I, I think that it's fair, if I may be critical of your slide, the, the, the slide really showed history, theory, and criticism. And it was, I think, a fair structure. Uh, let not, let's not uh, uh, make history into something that it isn't and makes, uh, and so forth. So I, I think it, it would be well to, to go back to the history, theory, and criticism uh, as, as, as polls. Um, uh, last point I, I think uh, uh, to, to make is that it is an extraordinarily optimistic uh, uh, field that we all share. Um, uh, Erz uh, recommended that I uh, add the word aspirational uh, to my, uh, I do have a chance to add a few words to the book, not much, but just, but, but the notion of it being aspirational uh, is I think in, inherently uh, uh, central. That is we really, we do have to uh, fit, <laughs> as I said yesterday, fit the purpose, fit the place, but also fit for the future. Because we're not, if I may say logically, I don't think we're building the past. We've not figured out a way to do that. We are, uh, in fact, preparing for a, a continuing uh, future. So, uh, I, gentlemen, I have to thank you, and, and where's Rebecca? But to thank you very much for the, for the actually thrilling way in which you've made all this happen. And it's been a remarkable thing to see, and I just have to join all of you in thanking, thanking you for it. Thank you, Bob, and, and, and thank you, panel, for not just your kind words uh, to me, but also for your, uh, your contributions over many, many years to this field. Uh, I guess we're going to have to leave it as that, very much as I see the book as really preliminary, as opening up uh, a great big territory for exploration. I, I hope this panel uh, will have opened up just a little bit of uh, food for thought. Thank you very much. Yeah, we didn't let him. Yeah. 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 That's too bad. There